we're going to be talking about what's going on with Donald Trump, what's going on with Joe Biden, and other big stories in the news today. I have with me today Judge Joe Brown, the infamous Joe Brown. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, I got to be infamous. You know, hey, how about this famous? Anyway, I'll take infamous because I upset some people. Oh. <laughs> well, I like to step on feet when yeah. they need to be stepped on. Well, you're a, you're a truth teller, which is always going to irritate people that don't like the truth. So um, I appreciate you coming on. Everyone that I mentioned that you were coming on was like, oh, I love that guy. So I appreciate you taking time. So we're, we're in a situation where I, I don't know where to start. We've got a former president with a bunch of legal nightmares, and we've got a sitting president with a bunch of legal nightmares. But since Trump is in the news this morning with his lawsuit, New York versus uh, Donald Trump and the, the Trump Corporation, uh, wanted to That's get That's the one that the DA decided to file as a civil suit to protect, supposedly, the constituents. I see what has happened with the trial judge on that. And I say this, I've been involved in criminal law for about a half century, all right? And I was a prosecutor. I ran the public defender's office in the Memphis area. I've been in private practice since the 70s. Well, no longer. I retired from that. I've been a criminal court judge, got elected to two eight-year terms before I did that 15 years doing binding contractual arbitration on TV show. Okay, so I speak in terms of that. I think what has been done so far is absolutely ridiculous. Somebody suspended somebody's business license for supposedly committing fraud, except the testimony from the victims of fraud is that they knew what was going on. It wasn't fraud. They made a lot of money from it. They understood what was being said up front. And that's like somebody saying, we're going to charge Joe Brown for writing you a bad check. And the person says, it's not a bad check. I went to the bank. I presented my ID, the check. I got my cash. It's not bad. Well, we're still going to find that's a bad check. That's absolute garbage. And I think we're having a problem right now wherein our judges are being entirely too political. This time on the left, some time ago it was on the right, and it flips back and forth throughout our country's history. But we have a constitution that's designed to tamp that down. But one of our problems right now is too many of the judges are essentially amateurs. And why do I say that? If you got referred to a doctor and you went to the doctor's office he's got the staff and everything but you found he had never done an internship in a hospital nor a residency you wouldn't feel too confident because everything he would have been uh, prepared to do for you would be out of a book rather than actual hands-on experience so you get large law firms now, and instead of the senior partners having hundreds of trials under their belts, they've got five or six, and the minor partners have been in there for seven, eight, nine years, and they've argued two motions. Uh, I can remember having 10, 15, 20 trials a month and scuffling to get them done, and now somebody says, oh, I've got a trial in four months, I can't do anything. Well, how many of you had? This will be my third trial. Well, son, you need to get it together. You have to learn the efficiencies of being a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of judges that are essentially rookies. Instead of being experts in what they do, they're where they are. You have that with the district attorneys, too. A lot of them are political. And I've already expressed my opinion on this thing with the civil matter, which just doesn't match the evidence. And the relief is disastrous, which should have been denied. You don't strip somebody of their ability to do business with that kind of flim flam lack of evidence. Next thing, let's look at Bragg. Bragg has indicted Trump supposedly for bribing Stormy Daniels not to Embarrassing. Well, I don't know where Bragg went to law school or what they teach there now, but half century ago when I was more, when I was at UCLA, we got taught to flip the script. Ask the question another way. If you have to pay somebody to keep them from embarrassing you, 
That's called blackmail. It's a felony. So in other words, Bragg indicted the victim of felony blackmail for being blackmailed and paying off. But okay, there was a nominal civil suit. It was settled. American law encourages settlements, whatever the merits of the case, and sometimes the settlement will be for an amount less than the anticipated attorney fees and cost. There's usually a gag provision that goes along with nobody tells what the basis of this was about, or you're in trouble with some court. So Bragg turns around and he indicts the corporate entity for failing to explicitly lay out why they paid Stormy Daniels. Well, there's a Bragg uh, gag provision in effect. So if the corporate entity had filed this detailed public record, they would have violated the gag provision. So a corporation got indicted for following the law, which is absolutely preposterous. Let's drop down to Georgia. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the lady because I went to law school with her father and know him well from years in the past, and he was kind of a militant guy. What I do find with her is in some of the counts on the 92-page indictment that I downloaded, it's public record, and essentially it's all characterized by one particular count where she says that Trump feloniously encouraged his followers to look at or read Newsmax. Now, I read Newsmax articles and I look at some of the stuff they put out and I've told people they should peruse this stuff themselves. So I guess if I said that to somebody in Georgia, I would have been committing a felt. I think that's absolutely ridiculous when people start saying that exercise of the sacred First Amendment, the very first ratified in 1791 as the foundation for the Bill of Rights. When you exercise that somehow or another, you are committing a criminal act. And that looks very much out of the playbook for the National Socialist Workers Party. If anybody doesn't recognize that, it's probably because you are more familiar with the German acronym. It's spelled N-A-Z-I, Nazi. And that's straight out of their playbook. It's fascist. It's classical. I had a science major, hard science, and I also had a minor that I wound up declaring as my major was political science. And in political science, that is a methodology of fascism to destroy the ability of an opponent to reply to an assertion that another political faction is attempting to assert. And when you make that reply criminal, that is one of the primary elements of fascism because the other one kicks in, and we've all heard this. Josef Goebbels, Nazi minister of propaganda, Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, they all knew this. Tell a lie long enough and loud enough and you can get anyone, including the liar, to believe it. And when you only are allowed to hear one side of the truth, that allows that truth to be perpetrated as a lie. It allows that lie to be perpetrated as something that will be believed, and it is a common element of deception. I may have said that wrong. In other words, let's take that back again. In other words, when you allow the criminalization of an opposition position, then what happens is you've got free reign to tell any lie you want. And that is something that oftentimes those who are self-righteously into a position are asserting. We don't want, what do they call it now, political mistruth? Well, Who's to say what is mistruth other than what the national consensus says it is? But you don't want the national consensus to have an opportunity to build. So you say it's criminal and you see this. It was on Twitter. It's not so much on X, but it's still there. It's in Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and people will be demonetized on YouTube for countering the supported position. You can't mention certain words, even though it may be on the front line of a newspaper, front page of a newspaper. 
there are a lot of things that are very scary. And I've been around long enough. I was in a class of 69 at UCLA. And I've been around long enough to have seen what happens. I work with Ed Bradley, uh, not Ed Bradley, Ed, uh, yeah, Ed Bradley, uh, mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Harold Washington. Uh, one of my former law partners was at one time mayor of Memphis. I've known several of the mayors. Uh, a vice president of the United States was a client of the law firm I was with before I left it 30 some years ago to go into the judicial thing. And a couple of presidents speak to me when they see me, a former president. So I know people who have been in places I've consulted for representatives in the U.S. House and a senator or two. So I can get around. I know some foreign dig dignitaries. I've met prime ministers of nations and we've talked. So I get the idea. And there's always this temptation to restrict the other side, but you have to back off from it even when you have the power because in politics, things flip very quickly. You want to say, I want to do this now for everybody's good, but you may not stay in the stay in power long and then the other side does it and whoever has whatever it takes they can impose that and nobody gets anywhere and you get into orwell's animal farm and if you are too lazy to read animal farm you can google animal farm and the cia put up an almost a word for word animation back in 1952 that is still good to look at because it's still high quality I think Disney had something to do with it back when Disney used to be Disney. And you get the idea. The animals have a revolution. They take over a human farm and they come up with rights for animals. And then the pigs uh, stage sort of a counter revolution. They come in and they start imposing these draconian rules. And then the constitution changes from all animals are equal to all animals are equal slash, but pigs are more equal than others. And they have a pack of dogs that they use for enforcers. So we're going there right now. Now let's drop down to Florida. Trump is indicted for supposedly violating the Secrets Act. Well, the US Supreme Court spoke rather eloquently in a number of concurring opinions in a 1988 case. It's called U.S. Department of Navy versus EGAN, E-G-A-N. And if you read the concurring opinions, you get this out of it. Under the Constitution, the president is one, the commander in chief of the armed services, and two, he's chief diplomat for the country. Following from that, he has the absolute authority and power to either classify or declassify documents. He can override the State Department. By the way, they're part of his cabinet. They work for him to advise him. He can override the Joint Chiefs of Staff. By the way, he's their superior officer with ultimate command authority. If there is an act of Congress that deviates from that congressional standard, the case is Marbury versus Madison, 1803, 100, 220 years ago. It says if Congress passes an unconstitutional act, the president may disregard it and an appellate court may in fact declare it unconstitutional, which is the situation. What he is charged with is removing documents from the White House guarded by the Secret Service. Let me put, sorry about that. Okay. What he's doing, accused of doing, is removing documents from the White House where they were guarded by the Secret Service. Now, to begin with, the documents by statute were prepared by the CIA and the NSA. This exclusive purpose of the CIA is, quote, to digest intelligence information and reduce it to an understandable form for benefit of the president. So it was prepared for him. And Trump has an didactic memory like Clinton did, like I do. And once you read it, it's up there. It's not going anywhere. 
And meanwhile, the same Secret Service guarded the premises at Malargo. So Trump removes it. Why doesn't he issue an, a formal written declaration? Well, Egan says he doesn't have to. He said by any means he chooses, either partially, fully, or whatever the case may be. So the removal is a de facto declassification, at least going to his premises. So they're there, these papers. The act that prohibits it is quite arguably unconstitutional. Next thing, the decisions say that right of the president, that authority of the president to declassify is the same as his authority to pardon. It's unquestionable. You can't touch it. You can't gainsay it. There is another factor here, and I think I know where that one's going because I actually got to take my time going over the downloads of the three, not one, three laptops that uh, Mr. Hunter Biden seems to have left behind with the repairman after we swore in the repairman and perused his downloads of the three laptops left with him. He did that before turning the instruments over to the FBI after he had repeatedly tried to get their attention. He couldn't until um, Mayor Giuliani got involved, Attorney Giuliani got involved in the process. But in any event, what else is going on is this. Had he turned the documents over, there is a good chance, a high probability that those documents contained incriminating evidence against the current administration. So if you have evidence of criminal activity, you don't turn that evidence over to someone to destroy, conceal, or whatever, who may be implicated in the potentially criminal activity. Now, that is a sham case, and that would have no business surviving appeal. Now, all three of them may get an initial trial court conviction, but there is no way under American law that those convictions, if they occur, should stand. The other thing is, is the Bill of Rights was brought in 1791 after the Constitution was ratified in 1789 just to prevent those things from happening. We see them now because the current administration seeks to abrogate the First Amendment. They act like the Second Amendment did not exist and should not exist. And the Second Amendment is number two because it backs up number one. And then they are really getting into the search and seizure thing with number four, and number five, the right to remain silent, they want that thrown in the wastebasket. So we have to be very vigilant because we are in grave danger of being turned into a fascist entity. Now, people keep excusing this. I don't care. I hate Trump. He's the Baba Yaga, the boogeyman. Well, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and may be used in evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Those are known as Miranda rights. Well, Mr. Miranda was not a good guy. And if we had the attitude in 1964 that we do now, we would never be familiar with the articulation of your Fifth Amendment rights because Miranda being a bad guy would have resulted in, no, we can't do this. So some people say Mr. Trump is the boogeyman. So he's horrible, they say. So we can't let him get away with it. So they're willing to throw literally the baby out with the bathwater. It's their own rights so they can get somebody. But you see, in America, the script gets flipped. Boom. And it may apply to them one day and they won't like it. I'm sure they won't. So I know when I'm on a criminal bench and there's a motion to suppress, or at least when I was before I retired, almost quarter of a century ago now, what winds up happening is the guy in front of you is accused of some very bad things sometimes, but justice is blind. 
So you can't see who that is. You have to apply the law, whoever it is. And it may hurt you to do it. It may be a serious felon, but what the state did to get the evidence they got, if you allow that precedent to stand, will harm a lot of innocent people. I'll give you an example. Now, you know and I know that all of us have been to a Super Bowl game party, right? Yes. And everybody's got bets on who's going to do what at what quarter. Well, in most states, even Nevada, that's illegal. That's a crime. But because you've got the right to be free from unreasonable search and seizures, two rookie cops can't drive down the street and say, hey, Charlie, look at all those cars parked in front of that house. I bet they've got a Super Bowl pool going on and we can go in there and bust some guys from, for illegal gambling. Well, you can't do that. That's against the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So we have these sacred rights that weren't set up as criminal rights. They were set up as rights for ordinary citizens to be protected from the abuse of governmental authority. It just happens that throughout most of American history, that authority has been brought to bear when it's a criminal prosecution, but it's still a set of rights that the citizens have so their government does not get to be authoritarian. Remember the founders had within their lifetimes left somebody that they felt was being authoritarian, that is the British Empire. So we seem to have forgotten that like a whole lot of other things that are going on now. And one of the problems that's inherent in this whole bit is we've got this whole country, 360, 65 million people. So one, two, three, four folks say, well, I got elected to this office. I'm in New York. I'm in Georgia. I'm in Florida. I'm in another one in New York. And the four of us decide that we don't like this boogeyman uh, being so strongly supported as president. So the four of us are going to cut him off from being able to run for this office to save America. Okay. Now people say, well, they got indicted. Yeah, but I got a whole lot of people uh, acquitted as a trial lawyer, even though they got indicted. Damn them, most of my clients were. Well, all of my clients, most all of my clients got acquitted when we went to trial. So indicted and does not mean guilty. No, it's just an accusation where the jury just hears one side of things. So that doesn't mean anybody has done anything. In fact, charge to the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Although the defendant in this case has been indicted, you are to catch no significance to that indictment other than it being a simple uh, accusation. The defendant is possessed of a witness that stands strongly for him throughout all stages of these proceedings, and that is the presumption of innocence. It stands with him until it is removed by proof beyond a reasonable doubt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you may presume that the indictment is, in fact, a mistake until the prosecution proves otherwise. So all of these people going around, he's indicted, well, he's accused. Well, see, this is not how America is supposed to work. You're not supposed to just get rid of somebody because you make an accusation. And we have innocence projects all across the country where innocent people are turned out of jail because somebody didn't tell the truth. We had the Rampart scandal in Los Angeles, the Ramparts precinct. 128 people had to be released from the California penitentiaries because for uh, detectives falsified evidence and grand juries indicted these people. So we have our law and the fact that people can stand up and advocate the way they do is a result of those laws. So there is no reason why we should be countenancing somebody going out and saying after 230 some years let's throw these rules out because there's a guy we don't like that's not the point and the other thing is some of our biggest heroes in the country's history 
Abraham Lincoln, amongst other things, started out as somebody that a lot of people didn't like. Yeah. So we still have that. Some people love Ronald Reagan. Some people detest him. Some people love FDR, most of whom are dead now because that's quite a few generations ago and some hated him. So it all depends on where you're going. Yeah. A lot of people detested Jimmy Carter and now a lot of people love him. So yeah. history has a lot to do with the perspective and things that you did not know, you might find out. So we need to be very careful of that. Now, I've gone on at some length, I guess. So oh, that's okay. it's, it's Trump fantastic. and then now Biden. Yeah, using that using that same logic and, and rule of law, uh, let's presume that Trump is innocent until they go through Proven their thing. Guilty. Let's, also, let's also presume that, that Joe Biden is innocent. Uh, until he, proven guilty. Now, until here's the difference. Guilty. Here's the difference. In law, there is a thing where you say you want a motion, you want a directed verdict. And what you say is, even if everything the prosecution or the plaintiff says is true, there's no wrong that's been committed. So when I'm talking about Trump, the difference between Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden is this. If everything they accuse Mr. Trump of is in fact true, he has not committed a crime under American law. Meanwhile, let's go to Mr. Biden. He's innocent until he's proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, assuming a prosecution is initiated. There is this thing about the box of classified documents found behind the Corvette in the garage of the Biden property. That box is mentioned in those laptops, and there is a back and forth about directing certain people to go look in that box or a description that one could reasonably interpret as being the box behind the vet. And when those documents were removed from the White House, Mr. Biden was vice president. He did not have that authority that the president has to declassify. So it was illegal taking them out. But now they say he didn't mean to. But wow. There is that document uh, that keeps repeating. It's called an email, and it keeps saying, did they get a chance to look in the box or direct them to the box, et cetera? And since it's obvious from the references in the emails back and forth between Hunter and Joe Biden that the individuals in question are foreign agents, since there is also in those laptops video from the modern White House tapes, which aren't just sound, they have video, and some of the videos have some things in there that would further explain why that information that, well, we don't know exactly what the information is, but why the contents of the black boxes or the black box happened to be uh, where it was, the content. So it's very scary what you're looking at in the video and frankly how this crackhead wound up with White House tapes is astonishing to contemplate. So I say that in context, I won't say anything further about it, but I will say that if what is implied by the White House tapes that are on that laptop, if they're shown to be genuine, the emails on those laptops, three, not one, are shown to be genuine, then you certainly have probable cause to proceed against Hunter Biden and perhaps Joe Biden for FARA violations, Foreign Agents Registration Act violations. And there are some other ones in there, bribery, extortion, a number of other things, violation of the Secrets Act, et cetera. And you see, 
though they don't apply to Mr. Trump because he was president and there can be no law restricting his authority that's constitutional, that does not apply to Mr. Joe Biden when he was vice president of the United States and the acts were committed. There is another problem with Mr. Biden nobody wants to talk about. It's called Article 6 of the Constitution. It says, the supreme law of the land shall consist of the Constitution, laws that effectuate, that means carry out the Constitution, and such treaties as have been ratified by the Senate. There is a 1999 treaty negotiated by then President Bill Clinton. It says, well, it got ratified that same year. It says the Ukraine and the United States enter into a solemn treaty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The parties agree that when the other signatory has proper criminal process, against an individual, individuals, or an organization, the responding signatory shall apprehend, detain, and extradite the individual. That's essentially what the treaty says. So in other words, anybody who's indicted in Ukraine, the United States by agreement is supposed to apprehend them if that person's in the U.S. or on U.S. controlled soil or in a U.S. controlled place, detain them and ship them back off to Ukraine. Now, early November 2020, the Ukraine Supreme Court unsealed a long, 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 multi-page organized crime indictment. Hunter Biden and Joe Biden are listed in that indictment. Is charged with extortion, bribery, solicitation of perjury, uh, a number of other things, solicitation of treason, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, under Article 6, one of the three categories of supreme law of the United States, a ratified treaty that covers that is in existence, and I'm sure they're not going to go do it right now, but there's a grave danger to Mr. Joe Biden and his son, Mr. Hunter Biden, to getting snatched and sent over to Ukraine afterwards. Although there is that problem of what's in his head. Uh, I mean, somebody might say, well, we don't have to worry about that with Joe Biden since he seems to be losing it. Hold him a few years and we can send him over there. He won't remember anything. But then we get into Article 2, Section 4 of the Constitution, which says the president or vice president, if impeached and convicted of the following three categories of offense may be removed, shall be removed from office and under the 12th Amendment not allowed to hold another one. One of them is bribery, and he's indicted for bribery. And two, I've heard many times, I heard it live and replayed the C-SPAN uh, little symposium they had where he's sitting at a conference table on stage, and this is in January the 2017 or 2018, I forget which, and he's bragging about, yeah, I guess I committed bribery and extortion against the Ukraine when I said I was going to have us withhold $14 billion in loan guarantees if they didn't get rid of this guy who's trying to get my son. Well, there is another thing. There is an interesting precedent that got set by the last Congress. After Mr. Trump was no longer president, they went after him for the second time with impeachment proceedings. They didn't get him that time either, but they set the precedent that you can go after somebody for offenses in office after they no longer hold that office. Their objective was to evoke the 12th Amendment, wherein Mr. Trump would not have been allowed to run for office again, 
But in this case, be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. There's Mr. Biden. So why are we in Ukraine, by the way? Are we there because it's a righteous cause that the United States should be interested in? Or are we there so that Mr. Biden can ride his way out of an indictment and in exchange for the assistant get the multi, 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 long, long, long organized crime indictment against himself and his son dismissed. Now, matter of fact, I'm surprised uh, at one other thing is the reluctance to do anything against this congressman who can clearly be seen looking around and then reaching up on the wall and pulling down the fire alarm. Yeah. Now, you grow up in the United States of America, and these days it's pretty uniform, city to city, town to town, state to state, region to region. Yeah, if you want to get out, there may be that panic bar that says, caution, opening this door may set off an alarm. That's right in front of you. But you don't see the panic bar, and then you see on the wall a little switch like that with the fire alarm on it. Uh-uh, I don't buy that. Yeah. No how, no way, even though he's presumed innocent, still proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt if he gets charged. But considering the context, that looks to me like a more rational and sound basis for bringing the charges that so many got charged with after January 6th. Now, January 6th, I want to speak to, too. Since 1877, there has been a law still on the books called the Confidence and Elections Act of 1877. When that fracas took place on January 6th, that was the next item on the agenda. What it says is that if it becomes obvious that the public is showing a lack of confidence in the electoral process, the vice president shall not certify the purported electoral college results and shall call upon Congress to appoint a 15-member committee, five from the U.S. Supreme Court, one of which must be the Supreme Court just Chief Justice, and two from each appointing party who are senior, five from the House, and whatever majority in the House gets the majority of that five, and five from the Senate, same rule on the majority. As things would have worked out, that would have been eight Republicans and seven Democrats at the time. This committee shall take a minimum of 10 days to do an independent audit of the results or so much additional time as is reasonably necessary to accomplish the task. 1877, they had a big mess that looked much like what happened as a consequence of November 2020. So they had this act in. Now, when this mess went down, Pelosi tabled that item so it did not come up. But it says the vice president shall not certify. So when you're going after Trump for giving his vice president in the precise language or reasonable facsimile of what a valid U.S. act uses, then what crime was committed? And this has been a, a fascinating discussion. I appreciate you weighing in and, and uh, helping us understand not only the importance of the Constitution, uh, but having good judges and, and good lawyers uh, and, and you know really understanding the things that benefit us. Um, you're, now you're running for mayor. I, I want to make sure people know that they can go to JJB2023.com to learn more about that. That's right. And the election is this Thursday, October 5th. We had early voting in Memphis, which has not been a bad practice over the last decade. It runs for two weeks. You still have to go in and show your photo ID. And when they run the photo ID, since your voter's registration, your gun permit, if you have one, and your driver's license, or if you can't drive, your state ID all goes through the DMV. What winds up happening is even if your registered address is not necessarily the one on your driver's license, 
it will read through the computer and they will give you the ballot that you have with the districts that are appropriate for you on what they give you to vote on. Now, early voting where we are means you can stop in any place. You don't have to stop at your assigned precinct. You can be coming from the store. Oh, wow, there are 10 cars in a lot. Let me go vote. And it's Monday through Saturday instead of one day where everybody's crowded into it from 8 a.m. to, well, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m where there's a real live mess, usually if it's a heavy turnout, and it might be a day when it's raining, so nobody wants to get their hair do wet and the vote count drops. So it's worked out pretty well for us, and the stuff is sealed, and you're not supposed to find out about it, not supposed to, until after the polls close on the election day. Now, let me say something about that. Uh, UPN... Uh, Associated Press, uh, USA Today, all the major networks declared that there was no significant fraud going on during the 2020 election in November, right? Okay, we got told that. And we got the term election deniers, and we've got this other mess going on about uh, suppressing uh, uh, false reports or false information or misleading information, all right? Well, in 2006, the U.S. Department of Justice came to Memphis, Shelby County, and they did an investigation, and they said that the election machines used in Shelby County, the bold election machines, are hacked. The machines allow one to access the vote count of the entire system from any one machine. That allows the entire system to be hacked from any one machine. Well, California, Ohio, Hawaii, and other places use these machines. And they all destroyed them because they found they were being hacked. 2008, the U.S. Department of Justice put the money up with Shelby County from seized drug funds to replace all of these hacked machines. Didn't happen. November 2020, we were still using the hack machines. Same week that the Justice Department said there were no uh, discrepancies in the American electoral process, that same week they issued another finding that once again in Shelby County, the machines appear to still be hacked and there are questions about whether a valid election occurred rather than a selection. So finally, they bought machines, and two years ago, they used them in a minor election in one of the suburbs around here. And the first time they used them for the county was November 2022. And this is the first city election since 1999 where non-corrupted machines are being used. Interestingly enough, the county commission is talking about they will have to raise uh, sales taxes in order to pay for the machines, but I pointed out inconveniently to them, why, when you've had the money for 15 years to pay for them, what did you do with it? So, see, these kind of things, a lot of people don't pay attention to, but you know, I like to read, I like to study, so I don't need but three, four and a half hours of sleep a night, so I stay up late at night reading, I can't put the books down, I sort of cram for finals five or six days a week, just because it's a hobby of mine, so I find these inconvenient things out, and what made me have this great television show for 15 years were me, Judy, Oprah, and Phil were all in the same CBS syndicated unit, and I was beating all of them, but Judy, that includes Oprah and Phil all the time, and sometimes her, but CBS wouldn't give me the same rating schedule that they got her. Well, that same guy is inconveniently using all of that charm, savoir faire presentation, and what he is uh, to spread the word, and a lot of people don't like it. So I find it interesting that what's happening in Memphis is going on. I'm probably the most famous person alive in Memphis right now. But yet, 
the mainstream media is doing a complete blackout on my candidacy. They won't even take my advertisements. I can going to sue them, but I mean, it'll be too late. They won't even mention me. And there's another Joe Brown who holds a political office right now. So they're putting his picture out there as the candidate for mayor, not mine. So when you look at it, there is a thing and your listeners may be fascinated by this. Let me give you another website. It's called followthemoney.org, followthemoney.org. Don't Google it, just enter that in your browser. It'll take you there and the website is merging with a bigger one, but there'll be a maroon and yellow banner at the top, knock that down and then you go down and you can put in the name of the candidate, the state, county, city, or whatever it may be, or the office, and you can see who's been giving that candidate money over the years, how much, and what that represents. And when I looked up everybody else that the press is pushing, they all have the exact same donors who gave them the exact same amounts. In other words, what an analyst I brought in to look at is saying is, they don't care who wins as long as it's not you because you will rock their boat and turn it over because Memphis not only is currently the murder capital of the country, the kidnapping capital of the country, the rape capital of the country, the carjacking capital of the country, it's one of the most politically correct, corrupt, excuse me, in the country. And see, people want to talk about street crime, but I've consulted in every major city and a lot of the major law schools and a whole lot of law enforcement agencies on what I did to reduce the statewide crime recidivism rate from 80% statewide in Tennessee down to just 18 in my courtroom. What I do where I went out in the Bahamas and in Jamaica and I dealt with dealing with the street criminal elements, organized crime and the government to broker peace what I've done here in the Memphis area with that, the fact that a whole lot of the cops, you know, are the grandsons of uh, cops I handled divorce for, divorces four years ago. Hell, one of my own great nephews is trying to be a cop. I've got a couple of godsons that are cops. So, you know, it is what it is. So you're talking about public safety and somebody says, I'm going to have a crime czar. But well, why do you need a crime czar? You got one of the country's foremost authorities sitting right here running for the office. And if you want the, and if you want the best barbecue sauce, jjbbq.com. It's some good stuff. You can, yeah, look it up. Uh, Tiffany Haddish. By, Tiffany Haddish is a business partner. Okay. And there's a Michelle Dukes who does whiskey. It's called Poppies. It's great and smooth bourbon. Uh, she's collaborating with us. And um, we've got a meat packing firm that's in Compton, California, that does the chicken links. And we'll be doing the Beyond Meat vegan stuff that tastes like meat. And she's one of the few women that has a USDA certified meat packing plant. So. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, uh, it's been well, great, and I know I'm running a little overtime. Oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. No, this has been this has been really great, and I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your wisdom. And I'll, I'll make sure to put those links down below on the video, and I'll let you know when this goes out. <laughs>